Welcome to the next video in the series of how to write a term paper successfully for your Methoden module, or if you're just looking for advice. This one's all about structuring your argument, how to make your term paper more convincing. And before we begin, we just want to say one caveat. We can't really tell you how to make a argument persuasive in itself. We can't really tell you what kind of argument is persuasive or right, because it depends on what you're arguing about. And Ultimately, if we say you've just got to make those good arguments, that's uh, that's not really a very helpful video. We'd encourage you instead to do reading, you know, read as many uh, academic papers as you can. The ones in the course are a guide. Uh, they are a basically a way of teaching you how to write a term paper in itself. A lot of these are following the exact structure we've laid out, uh, and that's because it is the academic structure. And the most persuasive arguments are maybe the ones that convince you. Uh, so look at those and try to figure out how, how they're achieving it. What are they doing and what kinds of argumentation do they use? You can also have a look at lists of academic vocabulary if you're struggling with that. You may want to look at certain conjunctions and certain sentence starters that you can use and then you can work from there. I'm sure there's lists like that online. There are a couple of books even that you could consult. There are probably some even in the university libraries, but that's that's another strategy that you could follow. What we want to do in this video is actually talk about how your structure can help you be convincing. So a little bit of this will be a repetition of what we said before when we talked about how to structure your video, but we'll also get into the details of writing when we talk about structuring the argument, constructing it, and also paragraphs. So the, that overall structure, which we've already probably iterated at this point, but just in case you missed it, it's the introduction, the main part, and the main part is broken up into theory and analysis. And then that last part, the conclusion. Uh, these are essentially how you always package a article, an essay, a book. Uh, they need these different parts and that overall structure also relates to how we will write the other structures. So each individual main part actually follows a kind of introduction and conclusion of its own. And if you want to learn more about introductions and conclusions, we've got another video for that. We do. And so if we are zooming in onto the main parts, because I think that's what we care the most about here. Uh, first, we have the theory part, typically, not always, um, but usually we have the theory part. And one question is like, how do we introduce the theory part? Well, we've got a couple options, really. You could start with a historical lineage of the theory that you're using, uh, but be careful. We don't want you to go into too much depth there. Don't, don't start at the very beginning of a certain theory. Just explain the history and so far as it, as it helps you tell us what kind of school of thought you're following. What's the direction you're going in? Be aware of how the history is useful for your argument. A good example is if maybe you're doing some kind of cultural Marxist materialist analysis. It might not be the best idea to start with the origin of materialist and Marxist thinking, uh, because most people already probably have established that uh, at that point. Of course, you could maybe drop in a quote or some kind of specific avenue that kind of begins this line of thinking from one of these beginning texts, an originary text, and that's a very common tactic. But you don't really need to explain where Marxism came from, or you don't really need to explain where feminism came from if you're writing feminist theory. That's right. But you would probably want to define what your theory is. So that probably starts with a simple sentence like this is, you know, this is my main theory that I'm using. This is what it is. And then you go further and explain what it is. And that would probably be a paragraph on its own. More on paragraphs later. <laughs> so if you've got your historical lineage paragraph, your definition paragraph, that's already two paragraphs at least. Could be more. It really depends on how many theoretical concepts you're bringing in. You might be bringing in a lot of different keywords that you need to define, especially if you're writing more vaguely about post-colonial theory. You might need to define uh, hybridity, orientalism, third spaces, and that's going to take some time out of your term paper to, to elaborate those definitions. But once you've done that, it's very important that you highlight what matters for your own analysis. So that means if your analysis is all about uh, racial stereotypes in East Anglophone life writing, probably need to 
involve some theory that deals with that. You need to bring in and say, like, how does this matter in relation to the theory? And what aspects do you need to highlight? You might bring in different theories or criticisms that have happened or interventions that have happened in your specific keywords or theoretical components and how they kind of play off of each other. And this will play into how many paragraphs you're actually going to be writing in your theory part. You will want to have a paragraph for each individual greater subject. So there'll be one, as Lucas said, for a historic lineage, or there will be one for the definition. And there'll probably be one per major aspect that you're focusing on. Ultimately, these aspects are what takes up the most of your theory part, though. These specific explanations or iterations that elaborate how the theory confirms or, or works with uh, your argument, or how it maybe makes it more ambivalent or makes it more difficult to handle. It should also point out maybe some of the issues that arise from trying to use the theory in this way. So once you've got your theory established, you move on to the analysis part, and we thought we'll have a closer look at what the inner structure of an analysis could look like. Basically, uh, you want to identify your main arguments. Quite often, there'll be three, but they could be two, they could be four. It really depends on what you are saying. It's just be careful not to have too many arguments because when you're writing a term paper, but also when you're writing for a publication, you very often have a word limit and you want to keep that. So don't go overboard. Take as many arguments as you need, but don't take too many. The three argument structure is popular because it's an effective persuader. Two arguments isn't always enough to bring someone over the edge. And four, five, six, seven arguments might be so unsupported or weak because you just have only so much room to write about it. Three is kind of the magic number. And you'll also want to order your arguments. There's different ways to do that. You could go from the least important one to the most important one. That, or, that sometimes is a useful structure because then the reader will end on the one that is most convincing. But there are other ways to do that. You could approach it from a content level, perhaps you are discussing uh, several scenes, you might go from scene to scene. So that really depends on what exactly you're writing. Relying on the chronology of the text can be an effective way, uh, as you build through the beginning, middle and end of, of an actual narrative. On the other hand, it might also be useful to order the ideas based on how they support one another. Sometimes our first argument actually supports our second and third arguments as well. And we're able, able to say something like, if argument one is true, then maybe argument two is even more true. So because of that, you will want to make sure that your arguments build on one another. You want to make sure that they, well, maybe argument A leads on to argument B. And then in argument B, you can say, oh, but referring back to argument A, this is further reinforced by argument B, something like that, you'll want to establish relations between your different arguments, if you can. And that kind of brings us to, once again, zooming back out to the broader structure. We have something at the beginning of our term papers that structures our whole paper, and that's the table of contents. And it's usually something a lot of your lecturers will ask for before they approve of your term paper for a reason. And that's because the table of contents allows you to plan this whole structure to begin with. Uh, it makes it so that you have a list of things that follow after one after the other. And when you make one, then you need to also think about how your arguments should lead into one another logically. The table of contents will also help you to make sure that you don't repeat the same argument. Because if you have separate subchapters, then you can make sure that everything that belongs to one particular argument will be in that subchapter. Of course, the subchapter will also be separated into different paragraphs. So again, there you have to make sure that you're not repeating yourself. But that is definitely something the table of contents can help you with. My suggestion would be that you collect your arguments first and then sort them into sections, because that way you can sort of tell which arguments belong together. You can see whether you actually need subchapters or whether they'll just be the main part with your analysis of the primary literature and you'll structure, well, three arguments perhaps in a way that, that makes the structure convincing. You don't really need so many subchapters in a term paper that's being written for a regular bachelor work for a term paper. And because of that, these sections can actually become your paragraphs. 
they can be the constituent parts of your chapters and that can make things a whole lot easier. Of course, one thing we'd have to definitely say is that these can change. They are, they're not static. And so if you notice like, oh, one of these things is really not working. I can't actually make this paragraph. We'll get rid of it and make something else that will support your argument if you can. If you're preparing a table of contents to show your lecturers before you get approved, you usually don't have to tell the lecturers the contents of your sections, just the chapters, but maybe try and, and fill your table of contents with sections that will then become your paragraphs anyway, because it will help you in the writing process. So when we actually get down to writing the paragraphs, there's also a structure we might want to employ. Usually we begin with what's called a topic sentence, and it introduces a new idea, concept, or topic. It is essentially what this paragraph is about, uh, because the thing is, each of your paragraphs is introducing new ideas to the reader. It's probably not new to you, it's probably not necessarily even new to your lecturers, but we're going to act as if it is. This is part of the academic illusion of persuasion, right? Just in case uh, the lecturers don't know something, maybe you'll teach them something new. Uh, but certainly when you're writing an academic text more broadly, there is a readership of people who are reading these things who simply do not know about the topic you're talking about. So you are introducing new ideas frequently. When we say that the paragraph introduces a new idea, that's also not necessarily a, a new idea in general, but just a new idea in the context of your writing. Let's say you're trying to set out the paragraphs for your theory chapter. Chances are you're going to quote things that have been said before. And so there won't be new ideas in that sense, but there'll certainly be a new idea in the structure of your paper. You have talked about the definition of feminism, and then you will want to go into certain gender binaries. That'll be a new idea because you haven't mentioned it yet. So that's, that's basically the idea. Whenever a new thing, a new concept, a new topic comes up, you want to start a new paragraph, and that can give you a little bit of a guide as to how and when to do that. The contents of that paragraph usually include supporting sentences, quotes, and or paraphrases, and they always refer back to the topic sentence in some way, or in the sentence, uh, sentence before it, like creating a chain of logic. That's because our argumentation can't meander too much. Every paragraph should actually institute its idea uh, so that the reader can actually read the first par the first sentence and the last sentence, and it, it makes sense. That stuff in between is how you get to that last sentence. Basically, the entire paragraph must refer to what's sometimes called a single controlling idea. That doesn't mean you have to repeat the same thing over and over. Of course not. It means you have this one idea at the center of this particular argument. You will present that in a topic sentence. You can then support it by explaining it further, elaborating, having all these supporting sentences that you need to make your idea clearer. And then you can prove, in quotation marks, prove your idea by providing quotes, either from secondary literature or from your own close readings, which go together with the main idea, the topic sentence, and then you lead on to the conclusion where you draw some kind of consequence from that. Why, why are you saying that? What's, what's your argument here? What have you just shown? So let's say that you're writing about how Open City uh, by Teju Cole creates binaries of toxic mas masculinity as your paragraph. So your, your topic sentence says, Open City is establishing these, this frame of toxic ma masculinity by doing this and this, maybe by creating a certain kind of binary opposition uh, between a strong man and a weak man. After that, you have a maybe quote from uh, Open City that says that or articulates that or proves that point. And maybe you follow that up with a bit of theory that points out how, when a text does this, it is confirming toxic masculinity. At that point, you've basically proven it. You can write that concluding sentence. Of course, usually we'd want more than a couple sentences in there. We'd probably want three, four, five. But this is uh, an effective strategy. And maybe multiple examples from a text so that you can say, oh, you know, this happens again. And of course, when we're using those quotes, we might have to introduce them and we might have to explain them after. We can't just leave quotes hanging. And that's going to be how we fill up a lot of these paragraphs. And that's also something we explain in our video on style quotes and paraphrasing, where we definitely repeat 
quite a bit that you shouldn't leave a quote hanging. So if you're still unsure as to how to do that, go and watch that video and hopefully that'll help. And I think that's about all we can say when it comes to structuring your term paper. I hope that this video has helped you. And maybe you now know better how to write a paragraph. Ultimately, as Lucas said at the beginning, it's always good to read other academic texts and follow their example. You don't have to repeat everything they're doing, but it's a good idea to read the secondary literature that we provide you with, with a critical eye. Try and find out how they are structuring their introduction. When does the introduction stop? How many arguments are they presenting and how are they presenting them? How are they leading on to the conclusion? If you read the secondary literature that are available to you, that is available to you in that way, that can really help you in your own writing. So I think that's it.